So, so welcome everybody um, to our discussion tonight on the, on the subject, um, China and Australia, how we see each other. Uh, and of, of course, particularly want to welcome our speakers, uh, Pradeep Taneja and David Brophy. Um, my name is Jeff McCracken Hewson, and I'm the chair of the Victorian branch of Australian Fabians. Um, now in the spirit of reconciliation, um, Australian Fabians acknowledges the traditional owners of the, sorry, the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now, when we planned this event earlier this year, the relationship between China and Australia had taken a definite turn for the worse. But obviously we didn't know at that time that the event itself would coincide with a pretty dramatic further decline in, in that relationship, uh, which I think makes the discussion that we're going to have tonight even more important. Um, and what we want to do in, in this event is that we want to ask how far this worsening in the relationship is driven purely by hard-nosed realpolitik uh, considerations. Um, and in, in the sense that Australia is, is in, caught up in, in a great power conflict um, and its freedom of movement uh, may actually be pretty limited in terms of that. Uh, but we are, want to ask how far, on the other hand, is, is this decline in, in the relationship a result of each side standing up for judgments that it is made about the other? Um, and if so, how valid are some of these judgments? And, and to what extent are they made in reality uh, in order to gain support for policies which are really made for other reasons? Um, and how much anyway should this sort of consideration be allowed to influence uh, this vital international relationship? So in short, what we're asking is, uh, could we manage our relationship with each other better if we understood each other better or if we showed more understanding towards each other. Um, and to help us answer these questions, we have, I believe, two outstanding speakers in David Brophy and Pradeep Tanedja. Um, and just before I introduce them uh, in more detail, I just want to let you know that uh, we will be taking questions to, and comments to our speakers via Zoom chat. Um, so you can submit chats at any time. And when we come to the Q&A, we will attempt to pick out people who reflect the main themes that have emerged and we will invite them to unmute and uh, make their comment or ask their question. Um, and after the formal meeting tonight, um, you're all invited to get yourself a drink and some nibbles and join us at to what we call our online pub. And I'll give you more details of that when we get to it. So our first speaker tonight is David Brophy. Um, David is a senior lecturer in modern Chinese history at the University of Sydney. Um, and in his recent book, David notes that Australia is in the grip of what he calls a China panic. Um, and he presents what he describes as an alternative to paranoia and pandering. Um, and David notes that some of the loudest voices decrying Chinese subversion come unexpectedly from the left. I wonder if he's thinking about us. Um, in his book, however, David offers a progressive alternative to this, which we're very eager to hear about. So thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, greetings, everyone. Can you all hear me clearly? Thank you to um, the Fabians for the invitation to, to speak this evening. I, I'll just note that I'm talking to you from uh, Bidjigal land in uh, Western Sydney on the Cooks River, uh, on which uh, Indigenous sovereignty was never ceded, uh, as is the case wherever we are in Australia this evening. Uh, as Jeff pointed out, China is uh, always relatively timely these days, but of course this meeting is particularly timely uh, with AUKUS 
signaling uh, a step up in Australia's efforts to uh, embed itself into uh, American strategy towards China. But I'm going to I'm going to frame what I say uh, initially here in quite general terms, and then I think that the meeting can gradually go into the details in the uh, in the Q and A. I want to also say that I'm here as a China scholar, but but also as a unionist uh, and an activist, and I. I want to speak as much from that perspective um, as the, the first to, to fellow members of the progressive side of Australian politics here tonight. When it comes to China, I see three spheres of debate in which we need to be articulating uh, a position. Uh, the first, obviously, is a foreign policy discussion. Uh, the second is the issue of racism uh, and the rise of xenophobia. Uh, and the third is the question of solidarity with, with people in China. Now, briefly, the, the position I advocate in my book, China Panic, um, and continue to advocate, uh, is a firm rejection uh, of what I see as a drive towards confrontation uh, and the risk of war that that entails. Uh, secondly, uncompromising opposition towards anti-Chinese racism, uh, and finally, internationalist support for people fighting for their rights or suffering repression in China. Um, when I say we need to articulate a position on these things, though, I don't just mean saying things. I, I also mean articulating in its, in its second sense of linking things, how we can link these issues so that we, are, we see our commitments on each one as complementary uh, and not contradictory. Uh, because in, China, you know, in the case of China, this can, um, this can be difficult. Uh, conservatives have their way of articulating these issues as well. Um, they argue that if you support the cause of human rights in China, then you should also support the, uh, the get tough on China measures um, that are being uh, put forward um, that talk of anti-Chinese racism as a diversion from that, uh, from that mission. Now in the middle in Australia today, I think you have people who are liable to be drawn in, in either direction. Uh, I think most Australians have a relatively healthy skepticism um, of America's intentions, uh, but they're also justifiably worried about things that they see coming out of China. So we're now in the midst of a, a dangerous tit for tat cycle of spats in trade and diplomacy. Um, it's been going on for some time. Um, and in that situation, it can become hard to see the wood for the trees. So I first wanna just step back and argue and, and ask uh, how things reach this point. Um, I do want to argue that there are geopolitical forces driving um, this crisis. It's not simply a case of bad policymaking. It's not driven by Cold War paranoia, although there is plenty of that. Uh, and it's not motivated uh, by racism, um, although racism is a feature of the, um, the wider context. Really, ever since colonization, Australians have tried to act on the world in collaboration with a more powerful patron. Um, if you look at history, Australia uh, lobbied Britain to take more notice of uh, Australian interests in its foreign policy, to, to incorporate more of the Pacific into the empire, to be less friendly to Japan during um, World War II, to put more energy into the, uh, the Pacific sphere. Uh, as is well known, after World War II, Australia gradually shifted towards a reliance on the US, uh, with Vietnam uh, being the clincher. Vietnam, from the Australian point of view, was conceived of as a way to anchor a US presence in Southeast Asia, uh, where it was believed uh, Australia needed, needed it. So this is not the, the logic of the lapdog, um, the, the term that you often hear thrown around. Um, Australian foreign policy elites think for themselves. Uh, they've independently uh, and almost unanimously come to the view that America's presence in Asia is indispensable. Uh, for what they deem to be Australia's interests. And this remains the orthodoxy uh, to, this, uh, to this day. Um, it's worth considering for a second, what precisely are those interests? Um, foreign policy is probably the least democratic sphere of policymaking uh, that there is. Um, I mean, AUKUS is a very um, telling example of that, the way that fait accompli is simply presented to the public without any deliberation. Uh, foreign policy is informed by elite networks with uh, offshore interests. Um, Australian business wants a, wants a profitable investment environment, voices from the security uh, and defence sectors will prioritise strategic postures, political alignments. Now, sometimes those two uh, objectives are um, in harmony, sometimes they're not. And in the case of China right now, they're clearly not. Uh, and tension has been growing at the elite level uh, for some time. Um, now, again, to 
go back briefly to the um, the uh, the post war. Um, Australia took a hostile view of China during the Cold War, um, as you're probably familiar with, before flipping uh, in the 1970s and entering a period uh, of what we conventionally call engagement. Uh, this brought a huge increase of Western trade and exchange uh, with China, and at the same time, it gave China a path out of uh, economic autarky. And, and it's engagement today um, that we've been told is at uh, an end. Uh, it's a significant shift. Um, but it is, I think, important to always recognize that engagement was never an open-ended friendship. It, it was always conditional, conditional on China conforming to a place in the world system that America and its allies were comfortable with. Um, of course, the high point of engagement uh, in the 1990s was also the high point of American unipolar dominance. It, saw, it was a decade of the Soviet Union's demise, uh, sort of the shrinking of uh, Russia's economy which of course China saw as a, a major negative uh, example. China therefore remained wary of the West's intentions. It continued to build up its military, refused to fully privatize its state sector uh, and became more repressive uh, domestically. Um, all along, China quite naturally, I think, had ambitions to escape its subordinate position in the global uh, economy. So there were always tensions. Uh, that's what I'm pointing, uh, pointing to here. With hindsight, I think we can now say that the slide towards rupture and confrontation was set in motion, um, particularly after the 2009 financial crisis. Uh, after 2009, Beijing's stimulus helped Chinese corporations squeeze out foreign competitors uh, inside China. Um, state banks issued credit to boost production in uh, industrial sectors, which led to overcapacity and a turn outwards, what became known as the, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Um, and this rise of Chinese competitors led to a souring towards China uh, in corporate America uh, and left the way open for a more, so more hawkish security perspective to take hold there. Obama, uh, you'll remember, launched his pivot to Asia, um, actually in the Australian parliament, um, which has resulted in a, in a large naval buildup in, in Asia, as well, of course, as an increased US military presence in Australia. But it it's generally recognized that it didn't stop China from continuing its own efforts to exert control of its uh, immediate periphery, to test the strength of the US alliance system, particularly in the South China Sea, where China feels itself most vulnerable to, to blockade. Now, those Chinese moves, of course, are aggressive and destabilizing, but so too, of course, is uh, American wargaming in the, uh, in the region. Now, Australia's perspective is a bit different to that of, of the US. Um, as the economists tell us, uh, Australia's economy remains very complementary uh, with China's. Uh, for all the talk of, of diversifying international trade, there is uh, some skepticism as to the possibility of doing that. At the same time, uh, the idea of America stepping back from Asia uh, is almost unthinkable to most of Australia's foreign policy elites because it undermines the very foundations of Australian foreign policy that I, I discussed earlier. For America to uh, withdraw would render Australia irrelevant to uh, American interests. Um, Australia would lose a seat at Washington's table, which is how Australia uh, imagines itself uh, influencing the world. And it would also impede Australia's ability to dominate its immediate region, uh, which it refers to in proprietary fashion as its uh, backyard. Now, as long as it's seemed that America was willing to do the heavy lifting to maintain its primacy uh, in Asia, Australia has preferred to sit back so as not to damage its trade with uh, China. It's when America seems to be slipping uh, that Australia feels the need to step up and do more. And, and here, I think the election of Trump was an important cat catalyst for where we find ourselves now. Uh, you'll remember Trump uh, initially talking a lot about deprioritizing America's alliances, all in the, in the name of America first. Uh, and that talk set, set alarm bells ringing uh, in Canberra. It was shortly after this that the security agencies turned up their rhetoric against China. Um, particularly ASIO's claim that Australia was facing um, unprecedented foreign interference. This became a mantra um, uh, in, in ways that I, you know, I believe were, were highly exaggerated. This narrative was directed domestically to lay the groundwork for a more confrontational stance towards Beijing, but it was also exported uh, into internationally, Australia essentially telling the world that China was a, 
a dangerous country um, with which business as usual could not continue. Uh, Australia led in other respects too with its, uh, its ban on Huawei. It's called for uh, arms inspector style inquiry into the origins of COVID. Um, Australia has been build building a military um, designed to fight China alongside the US for, for a couple of decades now, but things like AUKUS naturally have made that uh, much more explicit. Uh, so what I'm highlighting here is the systemic nature um, of this conflict and the dynamics that, that that gives rise to. That has to be the starting point for this, um, for this discussion. Now, worryingly, of course, from the hawkish point of view, there's only a short space of time before China's rise becomes a fait accompli. Its, its economic heft will invariably translate into political heft, uh, and that will diminish America's role in Asia. And I think preventing this by trying to catalyze a US-led military and diplomatic response has become the driving objective uh, of Australia's China policy. And, and sadly, I have to say, I see no difference uh, on this point uh, between Labor and the, uh, and the Liberals. <clears throat> now, I don't actually believe that there's a consensus as to how China might be contained or that we're on the eve of war, but there is clearly uh, a sense of brinkmanship in the, um, in the air today. Um, now, the trajectory that we're on, we're on will damage um, the Australian economy. We're only just um, starting to, to feel that. Um, but I do want to distinguish my position and the, the position that I think the left should adopt in this discussion from the kind of corporate internationalism that is part of this debate uh, as well. We, we do have to have a critique of the profit-driven free trade approach to China. Um, the benefits of that have been far from equally distributed. Those who advocate uh, that position often do slip into uh, apologetics uh, for things like human rights abuses uh, in China. We need to be talking about things that the progressive tradition has always talked about, a more tr transformative approach to international relations, how we can, we can actually get to a world where big nations don't dominate the small. Um, and um, you know, if we wanna put forward a critique of China's increasingly imperialistic approach to its region, and, and, and I think we should, um, that has to begin from an Australian point of view with a critique of Australia's own uh, power politics um, and its um, sub-imperial exploitative relationship with its uh, Pacific neighbors. Now, I, at the beginning of my talk, I, I outlined three spheres of debate that um, I think we need to engage in. Um, and I've only really had time to address the first of these uh, so far. And I, I, I just wanna make a couple of points uh, on the other two before I conclude. Um, and pass on to uh, Pradeep. Um, along with rejecting the, the really in-your-face racism that we've seen during COVID, we, we also have to oppose the idea that people of Chinese ethnicity or PRC background should experience heightened suspicion and scrutiny uh, as to their political allegiances. Um, we also need to insist that having sympathy for China's position on this or that issue is not a crime. Um, I think that Australia's new foreign interference legislation is, is draconian. Um, and it's a threat, not just to Chinese Australians, but to uh, everyone's civil liberties. Obviously, where there are issues like corruption in politics or universities compromising uh, on academic freedom, we have to take a principled stance uh, on those things. Um, but um, that's what we've avoided uh, doing, I think, um, in, um, in, in preference for an approach that singles out China as a sole bad actor. Uh, in these issues. Um, and finally, of course, we need to seek meaningful ways to offer solidarity to, to people uh, in China. Um, that requires us, I think, to resist framing issues of domestic Chinese politics in, uh, in simplistic Cold War terms as, as hallmarks of Chinese authoritarianism versus uh, Western uh, democracy. Um, you know, Islamophobia and coercive assimilationist policies in Xinjiang are things that trouble me a great deal. In my academic work, I engage with Xinjiang uh, more than any other, any other part of China. But, but I also recognize that China is far from the only country in the world to commit human rights, abu rights abuses in the name of counterterrorism. Um, that's a pretty satisfactory description of Australia's policy in Iraq and Afghanistan um, for the last uh, couple of decades. So the repression in Xinjiang, the erosion of democracy in Hong Kong, the you know, crackdowns on trade unionists in China. We view all these uh, as part of global struggles that, um, that we support. And 
know, we should seek to offer those impacted uh, communities here in Australia a progressive platform through which to get their voices out. Um, but we must not, I insist, see these as any kind of uh, casus belli uh, towards China. Uh, right now, the direction of Australian policy is really only making it more difficult for us in Australia to have any influence on the way that China conducts itself uh, domestically, uh, which I believe is all the more reason to be critical uh, of the direction, that direction of policy. Thank you all for uh, listening. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, and that was a very, very sort of balanced and, and um, sane sort of um, description, I think, of, of, the, of the situation, which is really, really what we need these days. Um, I would like to just remind people that, uh, you know, if you do have questions and comments, put them in the chat. I see there's some happening now and I invite you to carry on with that. Um, so our second speaker tonight is, is Pradeep Taneja. Um, Pradeep is a senior lecturer in Asian politics at the University of Melbourne. He's an expert on Sino-Indian and Sino-Australian relations. Uh, and amongst his writings, he, he has co-authored a book on Chinese reform and modernization and socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, Pradeep also was a graduate student at Peking University uh, and worked in various parts of China for more than six years. So he is someone who has truly seen China from the inside. Um, and we look forward to the insights that he can bring to this topic. Thanks very much, Pradeep. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I also want to say that I'm also a member of the National Tertiary Education Union, but yeah. uh, I, I don't think I, I can claim that I represent the union on this issue or or, you know, for that matter, my views to reflect those of the, the union. Um, I, I look at the Australia-China relationship sort of more broadly from China's relations with the rest of the region rather than just Australia-China. And, and I think given that I, I also work on the China-India relationship, which is a much more complicated relationship than, than Australia-China relationship, uh, it, it gives me kind of a different perspective in terms of, you know, China's role in the region more broadly, rather than just, uh, you know, Australia-China relationship. In fact, uh, as Jeff said, I was a student at Peking University in the early 1980s. And, and in fact, I came to Australia because in those days, Australia was considered to be one of the best places to pursue graduate studies on China. On, on contemporary China. I mean, there were some universities which were famous for history. ANU, for example, had a good you know, um, East Asian history uh, department. I went to Griffith University because Griffith University had a school of modern Asian studies at the time. And, and Griffith was considered to be one of the best places in the world to, to look at you know, contemporary Asia. And since my interests were in Chinese political economy, China's international relations, I thought Griffith was an ideal place. And sure enough, I wasn't disappointed. I landed in Brisbane and found in Griffith University and also in the University of Queensland, a very lively sort of academic community focusing on China. And everybody in Australia I found, and it was a new country to me. And then, although it's been 36 years since I came here, um, there was a great deal of enthusiasm about China opening up. I remember going to this conference organized by the Griffith University where Joe Bioki Peterson, some of you might remember the former premier of Queensland, Joe Bioki Peterson, who spoke very enthusiastically about China. Of course, Joe had nothing in common, you know, there was no ideological affinity with China, but Joe was excited about you know, the economic potential of China, the prospect for Queensland to benefit from a, an economic relationship with China. And as I traveled across Australia, I found that there was uh, the same kind of enthusiasm about China. And over the years, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, we witnessed, uh, you know, Australia-China relationship growing very rapidly. The number of you know, Chinese people you know, coming to Australia for studies, for business, you know, 
began to grow you know, fairly rapidly. And at the same time, of course, the Hawke Keating government was uh, involved in uh, you know, a very close economic engagement with China. Uh, Bob Hawke, for example, was trying to attract the Chinese to make a major investment in, in Pilbara region of Australia in the Mount China iron ore mine. And eventually he succeeded in, in persuading Hu Yaobang to, to actually visit the region and also to make China's largest ever foreign direct investment of 200 million US dollars in, in Western Australia. So there was a great deal of you know, uh, interest, a great deal of uh, curiosity about China in Australia. And that continued until very recently, really. I mean, we saw, for example, an expansion of civil aviation connection between Australia and China. Even provincial airlines started flying, you know, direct flights from, from provincial centers like Chengdu to Melbourne, for example. Um, so we saw, you know, a rapid expansion of people-to-people -people connections, business connections, and at the political level also, there were frequent visits by, by Australian politicians, ministers, members of parliament, prime minister to China, and Chinese leaders and officials, Chinese delegations visiting, visiting Australia on, on a practically on a daily basis. I mean, sometimes Australian organizations will receive so many Chinese delegations that they were a bit tired of actually entertaining Chinese delegations. And that was a time when Australian leaders were much more open to this you know, wide ranging relationship with China. Australia, I think, is one of the few countries that has invited a, an unelected leader of the Chinese Communist Party to address a joint session of Australia's parliament, not once, but twice. In 2003, Hu Jintao uh, addressed the Australian parliament. And then again, in 2014, uh, Xi Jinping addressed the Australian parliament. And by the way, in both cases, it was during a conservative coalition government that a Chinese Communist Party leader was invited to address uh, the Australian parliament. And I think that invitation to a Chinese Communist Party general secretary to address the Australian parliament was a way of communicating to China that despite our political differences, Australia was you know, not only willing, but keen to develop a good working relationship with the Chinese leadership. Uh, we fast forward to you know, 2021, and we find that the relationship between China and Australia is the worst it has ever been since the diplomatic relations were established in 1972. Uh, an Australian prime minister, for example, has not been invited, not visited China, since September 2016. So it's five years since an Australian prime minister was to China. Uh, since 2018, China has refused to accept cabinet level meetings with Australian counterparts. And, and for over a year, China is refusing to even accept telephone calls from Australian ministers. For example, when this uh, the trade dispute about barley and lobster and wine erupted, um, Australian trade ministers since then has attempted several times to talk to his Chinese counterpart. And other Australian ministers also have attempted to, to contact their Chinese counterparts, but, but their, their attempts have been rebuffed. China has, of course, uh, imposed bans or restricted uh, imports of Australian products from Bali to lobsters. And, and, and also, interestingly, Whereas in the case of um, other countries in Asia, whether it's Japan or South Korea, where China has uh, uh, sort of tried to use other excuses when it has sought to penalize these countries for their misdemeanors, it has tried to make excuses and found technical reasons for imposing restrictions on imports from these countries. But in the case of Australia, China is increasingly willing to accept through its official media, newspapers like Global Times, for example, that, that these are political decisions. These are decisions uh, in retaliation 
for Australia's um, you know, transgressions. So what really went wrong um, in, in this relationship? So from, from a period when we had a flourishing economic, political, people-to-people -people relationship to a point where Chinese leaders, Chinese ministers are even unwilling to accept a phone call from an Australian ministers. I think there are, and I'll, I'll try and outline briefly, very quickly, a few points. I think, first of all, China, over, over the last 40 years, as China has continued to develop economically, scientifically, and militarily, there was an expectation in the early days that China will liberalize, that as Chinese economy continues to develop, as Chinese people become more you know, prosperous, as a sizable middle class develops in China, then a large constituency for political liberalization will emerge in China and, and they will push for change. I mean, I remember uh, Bill Clinton, when he was running for president, he called the leaders of China butchers of Beijing you know, after the Tiananmen Square. But later on, when he became president, he said that, look, if we continue to encourage China's you know, economic opening, if we continue to encourage China's integration with the global economy, the Chinese people will take care of the rest, that China will, will change, will transform. That hasn't happened. That expectation hasn't happened because China, instead of liberalizing politically, uh, and, and the new middle class in China becoming a force for democratization or political liberalization. In fact, that new, new middle class became co-opted by the party. And, and, and of course, as we're discovering now that that co-optation uh, hasn't really uh, been a very smooth process because you know, with, the, with the, the difficulties that people like Jack Ma and others, other entrepreneurs in China have encountered recently, it clearly shows that that cooptation is not going very well. But it did mean that the Chinese Communist Party was able to strengthen rather than weaken its Leninist institutions and control over Chinese society, you know, both business and, and, and civil society. And therefore that expectation that China will liberalize, China will become like one of us if we continue to encourage China, then you know, that hasn't happened. That process hasn't happened. Secondly, I think the pace of China's military technological development has surprised most people. Uh, China was certainly growing militarily, uh, but the pace of China's military modernization has, has been quite surprising, I think, for a lot of people. The expansion of China's Navy, Army, and Air Force capabilities is unprecedented for the speed of change. So for example, just just as a reference, Chinese Navy adds as many ships in four years as the total number of ships in the French Navy. So you can see the, the, the scale of the expansion and modernization of China's defense capabilities. And that is something that has been alarming, uh, not only to the planners in Canberra, but I think in almost every Asian capital. And, and, and beyond. And third point I wanna emphasize is that um, apart from modernizing uh, and, and growing its military capabilities, China has also been building not just civilian, but military infrastructure along its border with India, for example. The, the, the scale of uh, modernization and construction of infrastructure along the India-China border is just amazing. Uh, China also, of course, has been building these artificial islands in the South China Sea. I must emphasize China is not the only country which has been doing it. Vietnam was doing it. But the scale of China's construction of artificial islands leaves Vietnam or any other country way behind. And, and finally, uh, since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012 uh, as the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, he has focused single-mindedly on preparing the Chinese military, not just to modernize it you know, for modernization's sake, but as he keeps saying, as he's repeatedly said, he wants them 
to be ready to win wars. So the rhetoric of uh, winning wars, winning and fighting wars, also is something which has been, I think, concerning uh, you know, to, to China's neighbors, but also it has, it has kind of undermined that narrative, which was created by China under Deng Xiaoping, that China would keep a low profile, that China would modernize its military, but at the same time, there was nothing for anyone to fear. Uh, so given that the number of things have gone wrong in terms of both our perceptions and in China's efforts, which have created concerns in various Asian capitals. So how do we fix this relationship? Particularly here, I wanna focus on China-Australia relationship. How do we fix this relationship? There is no easy fix to this, the current situation. Uh, some people have argued in, in academia and in the media that uh, we need to show more respect to China. We need to show respect for China be a better friend to China. So for example, some of Australia's billionaire entrepreneurs have said that China has been a better friend to us than we've been to China. Uh, and, and, and of course, some of these entrepreneurs themselves have discovered uh, that uh, it's not that easy to be always a good friend with China. Uh, so showing respect to China, be a good friend to China, and refraining from publicly criticizing China's management of its domestic affairs. So for example, uh, you know, comment or refraining from commenting on Hong Kong pro-democracy protests, uh, the internment of Uyghurs or other human rights problems in, in Xinjiang, Tibet or other parts of China. Others have argued that we need to give China a strategic space as, as, a, as a great power, as a rising power that countries like Australia and, and the rest of the world needs to accommodate China, give China a strategic space for it to grow. I'm not exactly sure what that means in practical terms, but, but certainly that, that's been the call that we need to create greater strategic space for China. And also, if you look at, you know, uh, particularly in reference to China-Australia relationship, most of China's grievances against Australia. If you look at the list of those 14 grievances that Chinese embassy staff passed on to Australian journalists, that most of these grievances relate to Australia's domestic decisions, decisions made by the Australian government uh, or laws passed by the Australian government. Some of them, of course, affect China directly. Others may affect China indirectly. These were not foreign policy decisions. These were in fact decisions or laws made by the Australian government or enacted by the Australian parliament. Some other scholars have argued that, um, uh, that Australia should engage in soft balancing of China. That yes, China has been developing significant you know, military capabilities, but instead of you know, uh, going and forming new alliances or, uh, or forming, for example, the strategic dialogue such as the quadrilateral security dialogue with the United States, Japan, and, and uh, India, that we should be engaging in soft balancing of China and accommodate China's growing strategic and diplomatic interests. But the reality, of course, is that China's own actions and China's own propaganda makes soft balancing and accommodation difficult to practice. The Chinese state media, for example, you know, we often hear that Australian uh, politicians should not, you know, engage in megaphone diplomacy, should not, you know, speak. And then sometimes that is true. Sometimes I think Australian politicians, you know, could do with a bit of diplomatic sort of skills. But Chinese Communist Party controlled state media seem to be using the megaphone much more than officials or politicians in Australia. And, and I think that's, that is something also we need to, to pay attention to. Uh, and, and for example, if you look at the, the meme tweeted by uh, a senior Chinese diplomat, um, which showed an Australian soldier with a knife to the throat of an Afghan child, which led to 
um, uh, Scott Morrison calling an urgent, you know, early morning press conference. Um, clearly, it was, I think, an overreaction. If, if, if I, would, I was advising Scott Morrison, I would say probably it didn't sort of warrant a special early morning press conference. But, but certainly, I think those actions and, and the kind of language that is being used by China's state media and, and officials uh, leaves very little room for any kind of you know, quick measures to fix this problem. So personally, I'm rather pessimistic uh, as to any early resolution of the, the difficulties that plague Australia-China relationship. I think uh, we are in for a, at least in the medium term, um, a fairly bumpy ride. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Freddie. That was, um, again, a very, insightful look at this and and uh, at the problem and possible solutions uh in a very very sort of masterful um summary of that i think um so i'm going to move on to um the q a um in in a moment um we've got a number of questions and comments in the chat so it's gonna be quite hard to um to decide who to um who to throw to number of themes emerging um, I'd like to remind everyone that if you are finding this event rewarding and you're not already a member of Australian Fabians, please do join. And this will strengthen our ability to support the progressive movement and to stimulate debate on the issues that all of us care about. Uh, and um, I think perhaps one of the team might put a, a link into the chat showing you how, how to join. Um, so I'm going to um, start off um by throwing to to hank who's uh, who's put a number of things in the chat and he's talked about china the china needs to become a democracy that sort of thing um but hank would you like to uh, ask your unmute and ask your question or make your comment yes thank you for that opportunity um look i am of the firm view that in dealing with other countries in this world um, and trade with them, one of the fundamental principles that we should follow, if we call ourselves indeed a democracy, that we should trade in total preference with countries that are also following parliamentary democratic models and are not, as in the case of China, a um, dictatorship, um, which, as far as I can see and read, is constantly suppressing its own population. That should be the very fundamental starting point, and we should be able to call that out. Thanks. Right. Would our, would our speakers, either of you, like to comment on that or respond to that? How important is that? that question to how Australia should deal with China, do you think? Um, look, I can say a couple of things in response to that, because it's actually, it is a notion that I think is gaining ground. And if you read what the Americans are writing, they have been broaching these ideas that there could be some sort of trading block of democratic nations um, that would be layered over the WTO or, or something like that. Um, now, I just, I mean, I just, my view of this, I'm, I'm a little bit agnostic on this particular question. I'm not that worried about who Australia trades with. You know, I don't think it was a great thing that Australia went all in on North Asia uh, and its export uh, industries and has left us with a highly, um, undiversified Australian economy as a result of that, uh, that neoliberal turn. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a critic of that. If you start to talk about, you know, severing ties with China for some sort of political ends, I mean, you're essentially advocating some kind of boycott, I suppose, of China. This is something that arises from time to time. People talk about, we need to boycott China for this or that um, end. Um, 
again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not in principle opposed to having discussions about those sorts of things. If someone can persuasively, you know, put the case that this is, this is viable and um, feasible and likely to produce some sort of positive result in the world that we're, we're living in today, why I'm a critic, um, you know, where I come in is the fact that when, when American or Australian politicians talk about this, this need to sort of cut China out and, um, you know, link up with fellow democracies. I don't see this as a strategy to advance democracy or human rights. I mean, I see this as a strategy to, to put China back uh, in its place and belatedly try to um, curtail China's, um, you know, growing position internationally in, in a variety of of economic sectors. Now, when that is backed up by a strategy of, of military pressure, you know, up to China's coastline, you know, I, I don't think that we can, you know, this, it's not an innocent gesture to, to just think that, um, you know, we should cut off trade with China and it's it's about advancing some sort of human rights um, campaign. I, I think that, you know, I think that ultimately these types of moves to pressure China are going to have a deleterious effect domestically uh, in China as they, they unite the Chinese people around the, the Communist Party. Um, I think that we'd be misled if we felt that there was a large constituency right now inside China that was, you know, ready to, to rise up and replace the Communist Party with something more democratic. Um, if, if the West just sent the right signals. Um, I think that's a, a dangerous delusion, but it is, um, it is out there. Those are, those are my thoughts on that issue. I just wanna add, uh, Jeff, that uh, uh, in fact, trading with a country like China can help in, in improving labor standards and, and, and in fact, achieving progress. And that's exactly what happened in many areas, particularly when you know, foreign companies first started you know, subcontracting to Chinese companies or started moving their production to places like Shenzhen and other special economic zones, they demanded because of pressure from their own customers and civil society organizations in Western countries that they demanded a certain labor standards in those factories. They in fact appointed inspectors who were there to supervise labor standards in those factories. So in some ways, I think trading can help in, in achieving better labor outcomes uh, and better respect for human rights than simply saying that we are not going to trade with China because it's it's not a democracy. Yeah, thank 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 you both for those very wise comments on on that question. Um, I have a question from I oh, sorry I didn't get the first name it's Castillo. Um, uh, well, a number of people have asked this sort of thing, uh, looking at the um, how we compare China's um, military buildup versus versus what the US uh, ha does around the world. So, Cas Mr. Castillo, can you um, unmute and ask your question? I hope you know who I mean. Is it Alberto? Could well be. Yeah, he needs Alberto, to be Albert Castillo, yes. He's speaking, but he's muted. Please, uh, Alberto. Yes, good. I think I'm on now. Can people hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I just, sorry, just before we go ahead, I, I don't think we've got a problem with the Zoom active speaker because um, it seems like you're on my screen, you're seeing my face the whole time. Mm. No yeah, one. here we are. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> oh, there we, there, we go. there we go. Thank you. Go ahead, Albert. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm not an expert, I'm an observer, but I, for a long time, I, I've been hearing the media and politicians exploiting their concern about China building up its, its uh, naval force out in the South China Sea, mm. um, the, the creation of islands or exploiting the at all and expanding that. And that's obviously something the world looks with a lot of interest and of course some concern. But from all the reading that I've done back about the system of defense that the US has built under the period of Pax Americana, I can't tell, but it, uh, my reading finds between 600 and 800 
bases and installations all over the world, and that's not including the space. The, you know, the, the uh, I guess, uh, satellites and everything else that they use to help conduct the business. So, um, I guess, why is the measures that China has taken to what it calls defending its own patch, not ever contrasted to what American did in colonizing the whole world with their arms, with their weapons and their uh, the systems that monitor everything that happens. And in the meantime, of course, while America was building such a massive uh, firepower or capacity to respond all around the world, they were losing every war that they were involved in around the world, dozens of wars and skirmishes. So while all of that architecture was being built, so why why don't we actually hear that kind of comparison now? Thank thank you. And and actually, just before we invite our speakers to answer, I've also got a note of another question on the same lines, which we might um, take at the same time from Howard Marosi. Um, Howard. Would you like to make your comment, ask your question? It seems quite fairly similar. No? Uh, we can read it. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, so I think it's fairly similar. So yeah, please, please respond, yeah. Look, I, I agree with the, the thrust of both those those comments. Um, the I mean, the conflict here arises as China is outgrowing essentially a security architecture to the region that was put in place when China was a you know a tiny fraction of the um, the American economy. Um, you know, in absolute terms, American military spending is is massively in advance of China's uh, as a percentage of GDP. You know, we're always bombarded with these images of Chinese military parades and so on. And, um, you know, it's the stock footage that they, they bring out every time. As a percentage of GDP, China's military spending is roughly, roughly on par with Australia's. Um, if you, you know, if you think of militarism in terms of the amount of social wealth being spent on, on the military, Australia is, uh, China is no more militaristic than, uh, than uh, Australia is. You know, we have to understand that, you know, what the American posture looks like to China. It's written in the most recent strategic document, the Ameri the strategic framework for the Indo-Pacific under Trump. America intends to maintain the military capacity to prevent China from dominating its immediate coastline um, in an event of conflict. Now, you could just imagine if a country thousands of kilometers away on the other side of the world said to Australia that our defense policy, our defense policy, mind you, is to prevent in an event of conflict with Australia, Australia being able to um, control its coastline. I don't think there's any doubt that people in Australia would regard that as a hostile move on the part of that country. But this is essentially what China is being told it has to, it has to live with. You know, um, and so I don't condone the kinds of uh, measures that China is taking uh, in response, but they don't surprise me. Um, this is very predictable, great power behavior. This is not reflective of some inherently um, expansionist militaristic drive um, inside inside China. It's, it's a fact that Western planners uh, have openly been discussing the, the efficacy of a, a blockade of the South China Sea for, for some time. This is a, this is a topic of, of open discussion um, in the think tanks um, of, uh, of the West. Um, so yes, I mean, there are very complex territorial disputes at work in the, in the South China Sea, but really, I mean, really what China is doing is wants to, wants to be able to lock that space down uh, in case of conflict and prevent, um, prevent a, a blockade that could strangle it. Thanks. Okay, if I can come in there. Uh, first of all, I think on the, the first question about South China Sea and American bases, I think there are two separate things. They're, you're right. America has the, the largest number of bases around the world. No, no country you know, compares that. No, no, no country comes close to American bases around the world. There's absolutely no doubt. But what's happening in the South China Sea, the China's dispute is not about Chinese bases. It's about claims. It's about territorial claims in the South China Sea. 
that a number of other countries share with China, that China claims almost 90% of the South China Sea, essentially as Chinese lake, as Chinese territorial sea. Whereas there are a number of other countries who are, of course, in, in they, they are of the region. And whether it's the Philippines or Vietnam or you know, Brunei or Malaysia, they have their own claims on, and I'm not even including Taiwan here, uh, they have their claims in the South China Sea. So the dispute is uh, that China is building artificial islands. It's converting features into uh, you know, rocks into, into islands and then, then militarizing them by installing the military infrastructure on those islands. So that's the uh, dispute. Now, China has been dealing with the Southeast Asian countries to to develop a code of conduct. In 2002, they agreed on a so-called declaration on the code of, the con code of conduct. And the deal was that they will then negotiate and have a code of conduct so that it is clear how each party in the region should conduct itself. And though that code of conduct still hasn't been achieved uh, because there are significant differences between what China wants and what other claimant states in the South China Sea want. So it's not, not really, I mean, the United States of course says that its official position is that it has no territorial claims in the South China Sea, but it wants these disputes to be resolved peacefully and to follow international law. Um, of course, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, America doesn't, has not even ratified it. So China says that, look, you haven't even ratified it, so you, you can't talk about international law, but all other countries have. So they say that it's not so much about the United States or what the US wants, it's what other countries want too. As far as China's um, military expenditure is concerned, David is right, China's, as a percentage of GDP, China's defense budget, at least the official defense budget, is, is way below the United States. United States spends about three and a half percent of its uh, GDP on defense. China's is roughly, and has remained largely consistent, it, you know, at around 2%. But China's GDP has grown very rapidly. So when you look at, for example, when I look at China's defense budget and India's defense budget, 30 years ago, China and India defense budget was the same in dollar terms. It was the same. Today, China's defense budget is five times that of India. And China spends more money on defense than all the other Asian countries combined, including Australia. So in, in dollar terms, in, and, and in terms of you know, the value of the dollar, uh, China's defense expenditure is quite considerable. And when you're looking at it from the point of view of Vietnam or Philippines or India, or even Japan now, then it becomes very alarming. So when you start looking at China's growing military capabilities, the amount of money that China is able to spend on defense, that is, the, the percentage of GDP doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is the growing asymmetry in the capabilities that China brings and their own capabilities. So that's the concern. Thanks. Thanks very much for those answers. Um, I've, I have a question which um, I guess is, gonna, is, is on a lot of people's minds, and it's from Miriam de S. Do you recognize yourself, Miriam? Um, asking a question about Taiwan. Um, it's not necessarily something we were particularly focusing on tonight, but I think it's on a lot of people's minds. Miriam, would you like to um, ask your question, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, just in terms of Taiwan, and uh, love your thoughts on um, some scenarios that you think are likely in terms of China's behavior mm. and uh, how you think Australia should respond uh, in those scenarios. I've been going first each time. I mean, do you want me to keep doing that or I yeah go ahead David. <laughs> <laughs> all right um yeah look we know we should be talking about taiwan because this is a potential flashpoint and we need we do need to get our heads around what is 
really a horribly complicated situation. Um, I say horribly complicated, I mean, you know, it is the official position of both governments um, in Taiwan and the PRC that Taiwan is uh, part of China. But, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of Taiwanese Chinese who feel that they never really had much say uh, in that question. And now the sentiment in Taiwan is strongly against any kind of, um, you know, merger with the, uh, with the PRC. Um, so the, I mean, the dynamics, I think, are, are dangerous on, on both sides. Um, I think that um, on the one hand, China has been quite explicit that it, um, it doesn't want to let this issue linger uh, indefinitely. Um, that, you know, people speculate this might be something that Xi Jinping wants to resolve before he, um, he steps down or, or something like that. Um, um, so that's dangerous. Um, at the same time, you know, on the American side, you have these gradual steps um, towards uh, beefing up the status of relations with Taiwan, which look to the mainland like a step towards uh, normalization of relations with Taiwan, um, which, I mean, basically, the China's position is, um, is, you know, they haven't come out and said that they intend to take this militarily by, you know, by hook or by crook, um, but what they what they have said is that um, any any move that would prevent the eventual resolution of this question um, in you know in way that, that that Beijing would be happy with, for example, a unilateral declaration of independence by Taiwan that was backed up by the United States, effectively a shift towards the two China policy on behalf of, of the United States that kind of thing would be the trigger for military action um, by, by China. Um, so, you know, Taiwan is in this, um, in this, in this bind where, you know, it, it, it feels very, you know, threatened by the, um, this massive PRC on its, um, on its doorstep. It's also quite constrained by America in the sense that America has also acted to constrain Taiwan's options, um, not wanting to get embroiled in a, in a, in a crisis with China surrounding, uh, surrounding Taiwan. So I don't predict the way it's gonna play out. But what I, what I will say though, is that when we, when we consider the possibility of conflict around Taiwan, you know, my starting point for thinking about war is basically Clausewitz, you know, Clausewitz's dictum. War is the continuation of politics by other means. If America decided to intervene around Taiwan and go to war uh, against China um, for that, um, it would be a continuation. It would be America's decision to try to resolve the issues that had been at stake in its, um, in its contest with China using the military instrument. Um, it, you know, it would not be you know, in my opinion, a war for democracy, a war to, to save the people of, of Taiwan. Um, a war like this would immediately involve attacks on the Chinese mainland. There's no telling where that could uh, escalate to. Um, people, you know, quite reasonably, I think, talk about the possibility of going to, um, you know, a nuclear exchange. Um, my position is that Australia should stay out of that. Um, in no, under no circumstances should Australia um, join America in uh, a war surrounding Taiwan, but we should be advocating um, politically for the ability of the people of Taiwan to decide their future for themselves. You know, the principle of self-determination um, is what we need to be talking about. And I think in order for that to be a, a convincing advocacy, you know, we need to actually advocate it in places other than just Taiwan, you know. Um, so <laughs> the problem with China often is that we, we take these really, you know, nice ideas about self-determination. We just apply them very selectively um, you know, ignoring cases like Kashmir or, you know, West Papua uh, and so on. Um, but I think, you know, I think that should be Australia's position, um, but no, you know, no military involvement. Thanks. Um, thanks okay. Uh, can yeah. I come in, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, on the Taiwan issue, I think China's position is uh, as to the use of force, because Chinese government has said, that it reserves the use of force. So it will, it will not give up the option of using force to reunify Taiwan. And it has in fact enacted a law. It's called the anti-secession law. And the anti-secession law actually sets out the conditions under which China will use force. 
to reunify Taiwan. And, and one of those, as David said, is about declaration of independence. If Taiwan were to declare itself that it was no longer a Republic of China, that it was Republic of Taiwan, then that would be seen as a declaration of independence by, by Taiwan. And from China's point of view, and that's why they've enacted this law, they, they would argue that this is, you know, China's law requires the Chinese military to take action. Uh, so they've created, a, a, they've, they've set out a number of conditions under which China would use force. And, and declaration of independence is only one of them. Uh, another condition is, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but another condition is that if they conclude that there was, that the possibility of reunification was slipping out, you know, uh, slipping away permanently, then that too, even without Taiwan declaring independence, that they would use force. But I think the 25 million or so people on Taiwan Island have been drifting, you know, increasingly away from this idea of reunification with China. And that is a big problem for, for the Chinese Communist Party, that the public opinion in Taiwan for, for decades now has been shifting away. The Chinese officials keep claiming that no, the majority of Taiwanese people want to reunify, but the reality is that that is no longer the case. On my last trip to Taiwan, as soon as I sat in a taxi, the taxi driver said to me in English, not in Chinese, in English, he said to me, I'm Taiwanese. I said, sure, you're, you're Chinese, you're Taiwanese because of, this is Taiwan. He said, no, 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 I wanna make it clear. I'm not Chinese, I'm Taiwanese. Without my even asking him any question on this issue, he insisted that he was Taiwanese. So that, uh, identity, the Taiwanese identity has been growing very rapidly. And China's actions in Hong Kong, uh, the way the one country, two systems formula has been trampled upon in Hong Kong is also not something that instills the people of Taiwan with confidence that a reunification would be in their interest. So for China, the problem is that the majority of public opinion in Taiwan doesn't sort of favor a reunification. And, um, and, and that's clear from the election of Tsai Ing-wen or re-election of Tsai Ing-wen as the president of Taiwan. Uh, so the challenge I think for Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is how do, you, how do you achieve reunification without using force? And if you do use force, then you are using force against your own people because you claim the Taiwanese people are Chinese you would be using force against your own people. And you're not gonna to win too many hearts and minds uh, by doing that. Personally, I think this sense of urgency that Xi Jinping has been trying to create is going to lead to war rather than any actions of the United States or anybody else. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the status quo. It's been like this for you know, 70 plus years. It can go on for another 70 years. You know, what's the harm? But there is this you know, growing urgency that is being cultivated in China. And that to me is a bigger source of concern than anything that might happen. And of course the United States, um, I'm sure most of you know this, but the United States uh, uh, doesn't have any law, any legal guarantee to defend Taiwan. Taiwan Relations Act uh, talks about giving Taiwan the means to defend itself. But American government policy on Taiwan has been of maintaining strategic ambiguity. That is, it will neither say that it will, it will use force, it will join in in any conflict, nor say that it will not. So maintaining that strategic ambiguity continues to be the United States policy on this. And nobody knows how this is gonna pan out, but if Xi Jinping were to get impatient or if there was internal uh, threat to Xi Jinping's position within the party, and he chooses to exercise the use of force option to unify Taiwan, to, to, to consolidate his own position, to strengthen his position, that of course would throw up a challenge for, for countries like Australia and the United States as to what to do. But if China was going to use if China was going to bomb Taipei and Kaohsiung and kill hundreds of thousands of people, I don't think, I personally would not like to see countries like Australia, 
say that, no, no, it has nothing to do with me. I'm not going to do anything with it. Let them kill. I think Australia will have a moral obligation. Australia has participated in, in conflicts with the United States for at least 70 years. And I think the pressure, if the US were to choose to then go and defend Taiwan, uh, then Australia really will have very limited you know, choice. Uh, of course, this would be a devastating scenario for the world, but I think Australia would not be able to stand by and do nothing. Thank you. Very sobering thoughts, I must say. Um, we've we've had a number of questions uh, on the on the sort of theme of can does Australia have to align with the US? Can Australia have a more non-aligned position? Um, and I'm going to invite Paul Sandringham, who has asked a question, I think, or, or made a comment along those lines. Um, Paul, would you like to unmute and speak? Uh, yes, thank you. My question uh, really is, um, why should we be um, making such an incredible effort to reestablish um, stronger relations with China when we talk about having an independent foreign policy, a grown-up foreign policy? You know, this was something that was introduced under Gareth Evans um, back a long time ago in the 80s, the idea that the Australian foreign policy should not be dependent on any great power. Um, and if we go begging cap in hand for a Chinese minister to take uh, Dan Tian's calls or Scott Morrison's calls or whoever may be in that position, hopefully after the next election, we're not actually improving our situation from, um, from what's suggested at the moment, which is that we do far too much listening to the US um, how about uh, Australia just forgets about these great powers and works with countries that treat us at least with a little respect? Who would like to answer that one? Do you want to go first for once, Pradeep? Just to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, whatever. I don't mind. Yeah. Sure, I'll go first. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean... There are, you know, if you look at the region as a whole, uh, there are other countries who are also bothered by, you know, China's growing power, and not just China's growing power, but how China is using the power. Take, for example, the concept of this Indo-Pacific, whether you call it an idea or a strategy. Indo-Pacific is a concept which some people in Australia and Canberra started using it, and Americans started using it. And in fact, it was Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister who first talked about the confluence of Indian and Pacific oceans. And then for a while, you know, this idea kind of uh, took a backseat. But in the last five years, it's been embraced uh, by almost everybody. So Australia, obviously now in its official document, going back to the 2013, Defense White Paper, Australia has been using this term increasingly in all its documents. Trump administration decided to change the name of the Pacific Command, which is based in Hawaii, to Indo-Pacific Command. Then countries like India also embraced the idea of India Indo-Pacific, but surprisingly, ASEAN countries, the 10 Association of Southeast Asian countries, who tend to walk very gingerly when it comes to China, they also released their own outlook on the Indo-Pacific recently. So they have also embraced the idea of Indo-Pacific. And of course, the European Union has come up with its own concept of Indo-Pacific. And that really, to, to me, that tells me that it's some countries like the United States who are much more outspoken about China's growing assertiveness in the region, Others are quiet. They do not want to say anything, but when you talk to them in private, they express the same concerns. And concerns may be different depending on which part of the world you are in or which part of Asia you are in, whether you're in South Asia or Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia, you have you know, different concerns, but the countries are willing to express those concerns. Uh, and, and they are, you know, when they are able to take collective action, they are taking collective action to send a signal to Beijing. 
as to whether Australian ministers should even bother to take, uh, uh, you know, to make phone calls to Chinese ministers. Uh, China is Australia's largest trading partner. Ideally, in an ideal world, I think they should be able to talk to each other. And, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with Australian trade minister or other ministers trying to engage in a dialogue. Uh, China, of course, keeps talking about, you know, the dialogue is the best way to solve problems. But China has spat the dummy and saying, no, we're not going to take your phone calls. We're not going to talk to you. So uh, I, I still think that Australia-China relationship, there is a complementary relationship. China buys Australian commodities not because China likes Australia. That's never been the case. Nobody trades because they like a particular country or they like the people of a particular country. They trade because they get good value, good product from a source. So China has been you know, buying Australian commodities because China sees Australia as a good, reliable supplier of those commodities. And that's why China until recently had not reduced purchases of iron ore, despite you know, restricting imports of Australian barley and lobsters and wine, it had not you know, cut its imports of iron ore because that will be cutting your nose despite your face. So China trades with Australia because Australia is a good supplier of those commodities. Similarly, you look at China-India relationship. China and India have a very complicated relationship. For the first time in 40 years, 40 Indian soldiers were killed on the India-China border in a conflict. Um, and, and, and despite that, India and China have a booming trade relationship. China, in fact, has a huge 60 billion US dollar trade surplus in its trade with India. Indian government is not very happy about it, but that is the nature of their bilateral trading relationship. So personally, I don't see anything wrong with, with you know, attempting to maintain uh, you know, um, a cordial economic relationship between two governments. But, but at the moment, I think it, the, the ball is in China's court. China is saying, we're not going to talk to you. I'm not sure, Paul, that if that answered your question. Uh, not, not, not completely, actually. It does beg a follow-up, or sorry, lead to a follow-up question, which is um, uh, that um, we've adopted policies of uh, boycotts, which, which David mentioned before, um, in our dealings with countries in the past, that on a larger scale than just one nation, uh, for example, against South Africa, um, and um, They've been suggested in recent years against uh, Israel um, for human rights issues. Um, so I, I'm also wondering um, why not when this country needs our goods and needs India's goods and needs Brazil's goods, um, why not say, you know what, you don't talk to us, you're not, uh, you're, you're, you're violating human rights in an awful way. Um, you're not going to get our goods for a while. Let's see what happens. As I'm not trying to be ultra hawkish here, but presenting um, the alternative viewpoint, which I think is is actually underlying my first question. Um, why do we have to? Why do we have to try and make things right? They're not talking to us. Then they can't buy our stuff either. You know, is there something wrong with exploring that position? Um, it's a stronger statement, a bit of a bulky statement, but it's actually what I think a lot of people, including on the left, think. Um, I'd be interested in hearing yours and David's responses to this, and also David's response to my first question. But thank you very much for your well thought out and reasoned approach. It's great to hear that instead of the aggression that a lot of people use on both sides about China, including perhaps myself in that last question. Maybe David can answer this. All right, there's, there's a few different things um, out there on the table now. Let me just, look, I do think that there's a difference between Pradeep and myself in, in the way that we understand the, what catalyzed this. I, I see Australia from late 2017 onwards making a significant shift in its rhetoric and attitude towards China. I mean, essentially pushing the idea that China was a dangerous country that was hell-bent on undermining Australian democracy, that business as usual with China could not go on. That was the justification for the foreign interference laws. Uh, and so on. It was a, a couple of years after that of, you know, that, that, Australia, that China began to take its anti-dumping actions. Now, 
again, you know, I'm not condoning China's response here, but there's only so long that you can go on bad mouthing a customer before the customer decides to take their business elsewhere. It's just a natural, you know, uh, law of diplomacy. Um, I I think, and I'm not I'm not as sanguine as Pradeep about the situation right now. I do think that things like AUKUS might prompt China to accelerate its efforts to you know, procure iron ore from somewhere else in the world. I mean, once it's so clear that Australia is determined to expend large amounts of its national wealth on military equipment that it wants to send to the South China Sea to confront China, you know, then I think it becomes quite a rational decision for China to decide that it, it you know, it doesn't want to prop up the Australian economy so much. Um, now, we'll see how that, that plays out. Um, but I think we'd be wrong to think that that, you know, that isn't um, some sort of um, some sort of possibility. So that, I mean, that brings me back to the question of um, boycotting and so on. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we, we do need to distinguish the position that we're in in relation to China from, say, the relationship of Western countries to South Africa or Western countries to Israel. Those two countries were essentially Western client states that were heavily dependent on Western um, um, ties for their, um, you know, for their economy. They craved the recognition from these Western states. Um, you know, for you know, a boycott campaign um, it, that can undermine some of those economic and, you know, um, recognition um, dimensions can actually, I think, have a significant impact on places like that. I think that the situation in China is, is quite different. I mean, China is already facing a whole series of sanctions from uh, the US in, in particular, which are often, often motivated in the name of human rights, but, um, you know, widely received as you know, a, a range of fronts in which America is um, trying to, to cripple Chinese corporations. I mean, there's, there's just, you know, the sanctions on these tech companies and sanctions on oil development companies in the South China Sea uh, and so on. You know, any, any move, for example, in Australia to say, well, we're not going to sell you X, Y, Z anymore. That, from China's point of view, that is simply one more, um, that is one more attack in a, in a campaign of economic warfare. Now, you can go to Beijing, if you like, and argue that that's not the case. <laughs> You're welcome to try and do that. Um, but I, I don't think it'll be very easy to get a hearing um, for, for that perspective uh, inside Beijing right now. We, we, we really do need to take that into, uh, into consideration. So I'm not in favour of escalating the situation um, through those kinds um, of uh, measures. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, my, my intervention here is not motivated by a desire to maintain Australia's trade balance, you know. Um, it's, it's motivated by things that I see taking place here in Australia, you know. Ultimately, I don't really care that much as to what China thinks about um, Australian policy, but the policies that we're pursuing right now are making us less safe. Um, they're putting us in a more dangerous position. Um, I think that they're undermining civil liberties in the way that foreign interference has sort of taken over from terrorism as the justification for new security laws. Um, and Australia is becoming a more racist place uh, as well. It's becoming a less comfortable place for people of Asian background uh, to live. So for all those reasons, I, you know, I think we need to step back from these, you know, all these thought bubbles about how we could, you know, get tough um, on China and imagine that we're, we're advancing human rights by, by those sorts of measures. Um, we're not right now. Thanks very much, David. Uh... Pretty, pretty. Do, do you want to add anything to what you said previously? Well, I just, just quickly want to sort of respond to David's comment about um, China, you know, Australia, if Australia is going to build these submarines, then China has the right to, you know, be upset about it. I personally, I think uh, uh, if Australia wants to use its wealth, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but if Australia wants to use its wealth to increase its defense capabilities, just as China is doing, China is using its own newfound wealth to build tremendous you know, military capabilities, then it is within the rights of the Australian government. I personally think that, for example, on this AUKUS deal, on using nuclear submarines, I think we should have a debate within Australia. I don't think it should be something that the prime minister can just decide uh, you know, in a morning press conference. I think uh, this should have been something which should have been debated in the Australian parliament. You know, after all, we're going for building nuclear reactors. And so if we don't have a nuclear 
power generation program, and we don't have a popular support for that. And if we are going to build eight nuclear reactors to be positioned on submarines, that there should be a debate within Australia. So I agree that there needs to be more democratic sort of, sort of process in coming to these uh, discussions. But then again, if Australia ultimately decides to have nuclear uh, propelled submarines, uh, if, if they are deemed to be in Australia's, you know, in the interest of Australia's national defense, then Australia is within its right to make that decision, just as China is within its right to make those decisions. Thanks very much to both of you for answering those. The, the, um, it's been very difficult to keep keep track of the, all the questions and so on that are bubbling up. It's been a very um, active chat, yes. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just going to try and take at least two more um, and we'll see how we go. I think this could, you know, it could go on indefinitely, but um, there's um, Felim um, and, and one or two others, but I'll, I'll, I'll go to Felim in a moment, moment. He's asked a question about the Middle East, um, which is kind of taking us, broadening us a bit away from what we were talking about. But I mean, it, it is pretty relevant, I think, particularly in, in what's happening with, you know, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Iran and so on at the moment. So um, Felim, you've, you've put a few things into the chat, but would you like to, um, ask your question about your comment about the Middle East and how that fits into the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my take on all of this is that China's major strategy is going geographically east-west uh, through the Middle East and into Europe eventually as a, as a long-term strategy. I don't think they're much interested in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, they're getting their hooks into the Middle East. So they've got them into Africa where they get their resources. And I think my view is that that's where the real fight is. That's where America's really upset because they're losing the hold over those third world countries where the resources are. And uh, they're seeing the Middle East being threatened or their control of the Middle East. And that's why they're engaging, I think, in these wars that we've seen for the last uh, couple of decades in the Middle East. And um, that's my take on why I think China's doing this. Uh, would would you like to, to comment on it's going a bit like a bit beyond what mm. the, the top subject, but it is pretty interesting. You know, it's difficult to avoid that that aspect. I think of the situation. Mm. Either of you like to comment on that? Ready? You want to go first again? Yeah, I mean, not not so much the Middle East. Uh, my understanding of Iran, I've had some you know visits to Iran and some dealings with the Iranians and and. They're pretty smart dealers, and and they they the Chinese have investments in Iran, and and China does buy oil from Iran, but um, but I don't think China will find e Iran to be a very easy customers. Saudi Arabia and China, of course, already have a fairly fairly you know robust you know commercial relationship. China buys a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia, and they have very good diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia is a long-term American ally. And unless that changes, um, I don't think there is any, any, any inclination on the part of the, the Saudi authorities to, to shift that focus. Afghanistan, which is not really part of Middle East, Afghanistan is more sort of South Central Asia. Uh, Afghanistan is going to be an interesting thing to watch. China has um, shown, um, some support for the Taliban. And uh, they seem to be willing to work with the Taliban, although China hasn't rushed to recognize the Taliban in Afghanistan. But the Chinese have been much more tolerant. They've been talking to the Taliban you know, behind the scenes for a number of years. In fact, even uh, in 2001, when the Taliban were driven out by the American forces, uh, then the Chinese were engaged in negotiations with the Taliban even as far back as 2001 with the help of the Pakistanis. So, and the Chinese, you know, China's only true ally is Pakistan in the world. And, and Pakistan has been the main conduit for China to engage with, engage, you know, with the Taliban. Although lately in the last 12 months, the, the Chinese have been dealing directly with the Taliban. They, because since the Taliban opened their office in Doha, in Qatar, the Chinese have been dealing directly with the Taliban. So they no longer need Pakistan 
uh, they, they are able to deal directly with the Taliban. But I think the Chinese are very cautious about dealings with the Taliban. They are not going to put too much money into Afghanistan uh, as long as Taliban you know, don't change their ways. Uh, they are also worried about uh, the impact it'll have on, on Xinjiang. And David, of course, is, works on the Uyghurs. He can tell you more about the Xinjiang situation. But I, I know, I understand South Asia better in terms of the you know, different regions of Asia. So apart from China, I work on, on South Asia. And Afghanistan is going to be interesting sort of country to watch because at the moment, there's no appetite for any foreign power to go and evict the Taliban. Americans aren't coming back anytime soon to evict the Taliban. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in, in Afghanistan if the Taliban are able to form a government which is more inclusive. In other words, it includes the Hazara, it includes you know, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks, and, and it is a more inclusive government which is recognized at least by its neighbors to begin with. I, I saw an interview this morning with Imran Khan, the Pakistan prime minister, and he's also saying that, I mean, remember, Taliban was created by Pakistan, but even Imran Khan is saying that he will consult with the neighboring countries before making any decision on recognizing the Taliban. So if the Taliban are able to establish some sort of stable government, then I think the Chinese would be willing to talk to them. But I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think China will pump in a lot of money into Afghanistan anytime soon. Thanks. David, do you want to comment on I this? I actually don't really have too much to add to that. I think yeah, that was, right. um, I agree with everything Pradeep said, yeah. Mm. Okay, look, I, I'm going to invite one more person. I think that's probably will be it. We um, And Duncan Calder has been actively, busily um, asking questions and making comments. I've, um, and so, Duncan, I'm just going to give you the floor for, to ask the question you'd like to ask at this point in, in the evening. And I think you'll be the last one. Duncan called it unmute. Got your hand up and everything, but you need to unmute. Sorry, my phone is playing up. Oh, well, Duncan <laughs> missed his chance. Um, I'm just so in that case, um, I'm just going. I've got. We've got a number of people on our team who who have been sort of helping me monitor the chat. So if any of you, uh, Megan, Robin, Jarno, Fernanda feel that there's a really vital thing we've missed. Can you tell us, unmute and tell us who you'd like to ask the, to invite the, to ask the final question of the evening, if there is anyone at all. If not, we'll, um, if not, we'll leave it there. Right, so obviously, well, that hopefully I haven't missed I've given um, you know, a reasonable voice to, to everybody. Um, at the end of this, I'm gonna read through the chat. I think we could almost publish it as a book. It's been, <laughs> <laughs> um, quite, quite amazing. I think we've covered pretty much everything, Jeff, um, as is a message in the chat. So thank you very, very much um, to our speakers. That has been really interesting. I, I think our questioners have kind of stretched you and you've uh, absolutely risen to that challenge and um, it's been interesting to hear you know slightly different perspectives um, on on this really really major um, question which is obviously going to be with us you know for quite a while um, so thanks very much for that thanks to uh, the people that have attended um, and as I've said the uh, the next thing 